Uh, well, on behalf of the Computer History Museum, our volunteers, members, trustees, and staff, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. I'm Dan Lewin. I'm the CEO of the museum. It's been about two years now. Um, it's really fun, actually. So tonight's program I'm really excited about for all sorts of reasons. It focuses on innovation in the world of sports and how innovation and innovative technologies are transforming sports, just like so many other aspects of our lives and the worlds within which we live. This is an example for us of how we are working forward in our new mission, where CHM, we're decoding what it means to be human in a world of computing, because life as we know it doesn't exist without computing. And our team has been reimagining the institution, our purpose and our impact, through a new lens, and that is this thought process of computing past, digital present, and then what it means in this world to be human. So as interpreters and in trying to make sense of this, we're using the frame and the lens of decoding. And these technological changes are, again, ever present. And so tonight's program really gives us an opportunity to explore and extend our new mission. So we're really excited about the program and your attendance. So as you all know, these programs are free. We'll encourage you to take a look at the website. If you haven't, it's new and refreshed. And ideally, you'll become a member and help support the programs on an ongoing basis. So please give that a look. You can find on the website under Join and Give. So with that, I'd like to now introduce Marguerite Gong Hangok, who is the founding executive director for the Exponential Center, which has been focused on building these kinds of programs and thinking about the exponential impact of technology on our lives as humans. So thank you. And Marguerite, great. Just like to add my warm welcome to each of you to CHM tonight. And now for tonight's program, sports. Sports have been called entertainment, a health imperative, big business, an oasis of community that cuts across age, um, geography, even ideology. It's also been called by some civic religion or even a force to change the world. In the words of Nelson Mandela, a South African activist and politician, he said, sports has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. If sports can change the world, then what changes the world of sports? Technology. Biometrics, data analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, a wide range of technologies are transforming how athletes train and compete, uh, how fans engage and consume content, how world-class stadiums are designed and built, how coaches and team managers uh, and owners make decisions. What's the scale? Well, it's not just on the field or on the court or in our homes, but it's also in digital arenas. Venture capital investments in esports uh, in 2018 alone surpassed um, $2.5 billion. And analysts predict that in 2024, sports tech will reach $30 billion. So how can we just decode sports tech? Tonight, we're going to explore questions such as, which new technologies are making the biggest difference in the world of sports? Across basketball, football, and others, uh, which sports teams are at the forefront of actually using technologies? Um, and what are the biggest obstacles for adoption of what's new? What does it mean for the world of sports beyond elite teams, for youth, uh, for college, amateur adult players? Uh, where are investors placing their bets for what's next in technology? And how are technologies fundamentally changing the game of sports? And how do we feel about that? To discuss these questions and more, we're really pleased to have a superb panel uh, for representing the 49ers, the Warriors, Venture Capital, and Stanford University. So as is our tradition, let me introduce each of them through five numbers. Let's start with Daniel Brusilovsky, Director of Consumer Products and Technology for the Golden State Warriors. 319.5 million digital uh, engagements generated, three NBA championship rings. Let's hear it for the Warriors. Yes. A lot of Warriors fans tonight. Two startups founded, one arena opened, and 16 the number of countries he's traveled to. It's Daniel. 
Next, Tracy Hughes, founder and CEO of Silicon Valley Sports Ventures. 0.745, the percentage of wins during her four years playing for Stanford Volleyball. Right. 27,717, the number of solo miles raced by the fifth skipper in the around alone sailing race in 1998. $1.1 billion of revenue since 2007 generated by the Cisco Sports and Entertainment Group, which she founded and led. 11, the place finished out of 2,600 entries in the Hyperloop One Global Challenge. And 49, the miles per hour speed of more David Owl's winning car in the inaugural Sand Hill Challenge Soapbox Derby. That's Tracy. Next, Bruno Perkovich, Chief Investment Officer of the 49ers. 2000, the year he received his BS in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from UC Berkeley. 40 plus, the number of active companies in his current portfolio. 15 billion, the number of dollars in the aggregate capital of tech mergers and acquisitions uh, transactions. Eight, the number of patents he's listed on. And 15, the number of triathlons he's competed during the last 24 months. That's Brano. And last but not least, to bring together these panelists and lead the discussion tonight, we're really thrilled to have George Foster from Stanford Graduate School of Business, where he's a professor of management, director of the Sports Management Initiative, and director of the executive program for growing companies. George says that nine is the number of newspapers he scans every day, 11 paid streaming channels he subscribes to, five different executive Stanford programs that he's directed, 10 books that he's authored or co-authored, and 1,860,037, the number of miles he's traveled on United Airlines. These are our panelists for tonight to talk about sports and technology. Please give, uh, join me in giving them a very warm CHM welcome. Thanks, George. Daniel, Daniel, great to have you. Tracy. Well, welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, just in terms of the content, I think we've got a real diversity of uh, ideas represented here and really different institutions. So I think we've got a lot of work to play with here. Um, one of the questions I'd like to start asking is, um, new technologies of breakthroughs can occur in many areas. And I've asked each of the panelists to describe uh, two innovative technologies or two new companies or two new innovative technologies that excite them. And if you choose a company, I ask them to choose one that was a relatively large company and one was a startup. So Daniel, do you want to start up in terms of what, what really excites you in terms of two new companies or technologies that you're working with in the world of sports? Sure. So first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's great to be here at an amazing place like the Computer History Museum. Um, so two companies, one uh, smaller company, a uh, company we work with called 4D Replay. Um, if you come to Chase Center, you might notice at the top of the lower bowl, there's 90 cameras there that capture every single play and create a almost 360 degree stop motion replay that we run as a replay in Arena. Um, it's a Korean company founded um, by an ex-Samsung uh, developer who's basically built this incredible software to stitch these camera angles together to create some pretty amazing replays. Um, they've done work uh, beyond just the Golden State Warriors. They've done the Winter Olympics. Uh, they've done the Home Run Derby. They've done the World Series. They've done boxing, uh, MMA. They've done a bunch of different events. Uh, but to me, it's really cool to see those that block or that dunk and to see that almost 360 degree perspective. Um, it's, a, it's pretty cool technology. So that's on the smaller side. Um, on the bigger side, We've been talking about 5G. I think it's been a pretty big buzzword. Um, we've been pretty lucky that we have a great partnership with Verizon. Um, we're one of the first um, venues on the West Coast to have 5G. Um, so if you're at Chase Center and you have uh, the right phone that supports 5G, um, you can get, uh, and I did this literally the other day, I got almost 2,000 megabits per second down. Oh. Wow. Which to me, in my mind, being that I'm a tech guy, Imagine how excited I got after seeing how much bandwidth I could possibly have to do things like video streaming and um, anything my, my heart could desire. So um, I'm very excited for that potential. Uh, I mean, I think Chase Center really is a wonderful institution. It really sets the bar 
in terms of technologies. When you walk in and you see this amazing huge screen there that redefines the size. Yeah, the largest uh, indoor scoreboard for a venue in North America. Yeah. And there's more cameras. There's cameras at the top of the building that capture all the data that goes to the NBA headquarters straight away for all, so all I can do is plot the analytics, everything that moves in that building, there's a camera on that. Tracy. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with a big company and one of the ones that I've, is no stranger to anybody in this room and one of the ones that I've been tracking on for quite some time and I'm very impressed by the evolution of what they've been doing in sport is Microsoft. And as we know, it's a huge company and what they've been able to do to harness their enabling technologies and work with this new proliferation of data specifically that sports churns out and whether it's Formula One race cars or whether it's soccer players, um, Microsoft really has taken a, a big commitment or made a big commitment to sport and been able to tell their story through the data that we know comes from sports, the athletes, the events themselves. From a small company standpoint, there's one just here uh, in Palo Alto. The name of it is called SyncThink. And what SyncThink does is basically act like a thermometer for the brain. It uses VR to allow brain performance to be monitored. And so if you could imagine how important it is for the athletes uh, that play these sports, uh, whether they're impact sports or whether they're not, team sports, it doesn't matter. Everybody wants to be rested. And so they talk a lot about sleep. But how do we know if sleep is really doing a good job? How do we know if maybe you're dehydrated or maybe that long flight, uh, certainly with NBA season, there's a lot of travel involved and, and playing back-to-back -back nights. And so this company actually uses uh, virtual reality to measure the eyes and tracking patterns that the eyes can uh, basically convey the health and the performance of the brain. And so I'm really interested in this. It has FDA clearance and uh, a whole fleet of intellectual property. So it's a compelling uh, company that was originally created to uh, determine battlefield readiness for soldiers in the military. And so it's uh, not a small leap to um, make sure that the technology is relevant for elite athletes as well. The sleep thing's a really interesting area. I, I work with the San Antonio Spurs and uh, they had their players uh, voluntarily dis decide tracking of the sleep. And what they found out that one player, Tony Parker, just had this incredible ability to go to sleep within about two minutes on the plane and have the deepest sleep possible. And they, and they actually claimed that that was a major reason that he was so successful because he just had that capability of saying at the front of the train, uh, plane and say, all the rest of the play, play cards, what you like, I'm going to sleep. And it wasn't just sleep, it was deep sleep. And that's what athletes are really worrying about. Uh, how can they, the best ability is availability, is what the phrase that's used for a lot of GMs. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you believe that players are physically able to perform at a level and you kind of take it away, the sleep ends up being, if not this single, then one of the major drivers of the yeah. um, elite, elite performance. Um, from, from my side, when I, as, as you ask question, what kind of technologies are interesting, I think I'm, I'm fascinated by content, um, how it's delivered and how it's consumed. Um, I have two little ones at home and I can help but think and imagine what their sports viewing experience is going to look like uh, 10, 15, 20 years from now. I don't know what it is, but I know it's not going to be anything like what we have now. I think time of linear viewing, meaning you're in our sport majority on a Sunday, you're, uh, you're on your couch and watch the game from start to the end. Uh, on TV is quite frankly largely gone. I don't think the TV goes away itself, but you're gonna start to see a lot of smart overlays, um, a lot of personalization, how that content is delivered and where. Um, with that, it's, it's funny, um, Daniel was mentioning uh, for the replay. Uh, we work with Intel very closely. Um, who's a major partner, and they have a major initiative um, around a program called True View, which brings this volumetric um, element to, to play, um, capturing the, the, essentially the whole size of the volume of the place like Levi Stadium, for example, um, through some major compute uh, powers, they're able to then deliver essentially a content that can be highly, highly customized. Um, you can imagine one day being able to actually view any play from any perspective. So you can put yourself in a shoes at the eye level of quarterback and replay that pass from the quarterback's perspective. Or you can be a wide receiver or you can run along, um, you know, uh, a, um, 
you know, tight end, uh, which I think has a pretty major implication on, on what the content looks like uh, going forward. Um, on the small company side, we can imagine as, as, as the others in the panels, uh, we get to see a lot. Um, you know, the, 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 one, of the, one of the elements and one of the things that, that we also are pretty interested in is, is the whole concept of gaming. Um, I think you will see the, um, the closer and closer collaboration, if not overlay, between kind of gaming experience and real sports. Um, Esports has a big uh, footprint and only continues to grow. Um, We've invested in grow and in, in working with a company in LA called Play Versus that essentially is bringing um, all the major titles to the uh, to the amateur um, in, in high school arena where they organize um, tournaments. Uh, they're putting in a lot of uh, kind of elements around anti-bullying and making it safer for kids to play, um, which is obviously great for parents, great for school, great for for e athletes, and great for the for the brands. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about them. Yeah, I think one illustration of technology, what Bruno was talking about, Intel, in terms of the 360 degree, technology moves just incredibly quickly. I remember I was working with a company and we mic'd up, not mic'd up, but we cameraed up uh, stadium for the Super Bowl. This was probably about 10 years ago, and it cost us a million dollars to put all the cameras around to capture 360. And it was really important in terms of whether a, a ball went across the line for a, a, a I was going to say a try, but that's from my rugby world. <laughs> um, but um, basically, Intel can do it faster, cheaper, and better. And that, I think that's, that whole notion of faster, cheaper, better is part of the, the trends that's going, not just new technologies, but implementable technologies. Um, ask Tracy, because I'm going to vary it around. Um, each of you get inundated with proposals for new technologies. And the question is, how do you decide which technologies are worth your effort to go to the next level either time, bring in other people, because you could spend your day analyzing 20 packages that come in each week. And how do you, how do, you do that? And they arrive in all shapes and sizes, too. Um, it's, it's pretty compelling uh, what the entrepreneurs will do to get, get some attention and, and also get some feedback on, on what they believe their product or service uh, can do for sports. So uh, for us, it, we're a small boutique uh, accelerator and investment arm in Menlo Park. And we receive a lot of uh, proposals that uh, simply come splashing in and one of the things we recognize early on is to create some sort of scorecard in order to vet the, the proposals and actually the companies and the founders themselves as well as the technology um, so that it, it meets some of the criteria that we have. And while that's proprietary, I'm happy to share that it certainly involves the usual things, uh, the team, the founder, uh, the strength of the intellectual property that's involved, uh, that classic product market fit, the, the, the relevance, given the, some of the trends that we'll touch on tonight, and, and also um, you know, things like how coachable the founder is, and, and uh, do they have what we call a Silicon Valley state of mind? And are they willing to uh, you know, release that white knuckle grip on something that they might have created very passionately and very intently years ago, and, and make the pivots as the market uh, calls for. So those are some of the things we look for. Uh, this is a close relationship that's built over time, especially when money gets involved. And, and so it, uh, it really helps to be extremely discerning from that first moment that you see the proposals coming in. Uh, this really is a question for Daniel and Brano. Both of you have moved from stadiums or arenas where you were tenants, mm -hmm. and you're now you're basically entertainment houses where you have a team, you own a building, you run shows, and so that means that the new technologies that are being put in front of you is keep on exploding in multiple areas. Daniel, how do you sort of prioritize what comes through, and who do you look for within the building or beyond the building to sort of decide these 5%, if that, get... Yeah, yeah it's definitely the, the million or billion dollar question, depending on how you look at it. Um, over the last few years, I think the, the biggest um, thing that I've tried to do is develop a lens in which, um, in the same way Tracy may look at a company with a scorecard, kind of what's my kind of barometer of uh, what's worth looking at and exploring further. And, and over the last few years, it really started coming down to, to kind of two things. One is, does this improve the fan experience? 
Um, and does this create a new revenue opportunity for us? Mm -hmm. And so when I look at a company or a technology, whatever it is, my hope is that it can solve both of those questions. Um, if it solves one of them, it's fine. Uh, but in a perfect world, you know, we want to be able to really improve the fan experience while also uh, creating a great product by creating revenue opportunities for us as a team mm -hmm. and as a venue as well. And so um, that lens has shifted a little bit because as you mentioned, when we were playing at, uh, in Oakland, we were just a tenant. We would show up, the lights are on, the court's down, we would play and then we would leave. Now at Chase Center, we 100% own and operate uh, the building and the entire uh, city block, which we have an area called Thrive City, which includes uh, retail, a plaza. Um, there's uh, gonna be a park across the street that the city is in the process of building. So it's much more than just an arena. And so now you're starting to look at, uh, not just from the lens of fan experience in the building, but what happens outside the building from a retail perspective, from a, a 365 day a year activation perspective. These buildings are, are truly living, breathing, you know, organisms, uh, organisms in a way. And so you need to think about it more beyond just that scope. And so over, over time, that, my, that lens has shifted, but I think it still really comes down to, does this uh, really enhance the fan experience, whether it's in the venue, outside of the venue, digital platforms, uh, international fans, whatever it may be, and can this create a new revenue opportunity for us? Okay, um, Brano, um, if you looked at the proposals, you can expand on that, but some of your proposals on the playing side that may be relevant to the coaches, the GM, um, what, how do you sort of filter through? Because you actually have a related fund that which you're investing money in. Yeah, so uh, my follow-up question was gonna be, you're, you're thinking about us as an investor, us and as, as an operator, which is related, but we'll certainly invest in a companies that um, you know, don't necessarily relate directly to what we do at, at core, which is always going to be a professional sports franchise. And we also work with companies that we don't invest into, right? Um, so it's great when the two overlap and we actually invest and then have a, have a way to actually help companies grow, whether on the business or football side, but it doesn't happen all, all the time. Um, look, it comes down to ROI and it's kind of not surprisingly what Daniel was talking about, um, our organization talk weekly. Um, so, um, it's, it's very difficult when I, when I see startups and for those maybe in the audience that are thinking about starting or already have a company that, that may be addressing professional sports. Um, you know, the concept of fan experience or concept of getting more data is great, but we're getting to a point of diminishing return where having more data is interesting, but not necessarily super valuable. Uh, the question becomes, so what, right? How can you help me grow our business, or how can you help us, you know, get our players to a place that can be, you know, bigger, faster, staying longer in the zone, whatever that may be. Um, you know, very quickly, the, the, you know, discussion going to, and I hate yet hate to use the word gimmicky, where it's kind of nice to have, but certainly not something we would want to pay for, if that makes sense, right? So that concept of ROI has to be very specific. How can you actually help us um, either on the business side or on the team side, perform better. Um, the, um, and then lastly, I would say, um, it always hates me, hate, I hate when it happens where startup founders come from the technology side, maybe as a, as a fans first, and they have their own personal experiences that they're trying to solve and spend months and months and months developing a certain piece of technology, come to our building, present a case, for the technology without actually thinking through or understanding what the ecosystem looks like. Because the sports ecosystem, there's a lot of what I would call non-market forces at play. Things like, um, you know, sponsorship deals, you know, who owns content. I'll give an example, VR for many years was an interesting and pretty hot topic. And we would have a couple of founders come in and say, wouldn't it be great if your fans could put the goggles on and watch your game from the 50 yard line? Like, yes, but did you talk to our broadcasting partners? Because we actually do not, as a team, do not own content, our own yeah. content. Well, it's your team, it's your venue, what do you mean, right? So, you know, lack of understanding around what the structure of the, of the sports industry look like um, is, is very challenging. And again, if, if there's a way to get ahead of that, and understand what it looks like, that they can, can go out and actually go into the business development process a little bit differently can certainly be, be helpful. Yeah. Tracy? 
having taken entrepreneurs into both of these franchises, part of being here in Silicon Valley is getting to work with outlier teams and ownership and venues and executives and, and then, of course, athletes and, and fans. There's an increased expectation. And so it really has been, I think, accelerative for our work with these early stage companies to remind them of, for example, Bruno mentioned sponsorship. It, it, it is just a, a non-starter if there is a pilot that has been done with a, a Verizon, but it's an AT&T venue, or a, even you know Coke, Pepsi. These are very binary examples, but sponsorship is the currency for for so many decades. Sponsorship is the currency of the sports industry, and there's very strict lines of demarcation between team sponsors and league sponsors and then media partners, and those lines are blurring a bit, but it sure does help working with early stage companies just for that basic understanding of the relevance of their solution for a particular sport, much less the sponsorship portfolio or, or other incumbent relationships that are there. So that is something that is a real barrier to entry for many startups. Um, they do lead with their fandom, and quite often they don't necessarily understand just how complex the, the uh, business models are for these teams, and not only venue ownership yeah. or tenancy, but new media models and disruptive uh, business models as they relate to content. And so I, I do think it's, it's, a, um, it's a difficult space sometimes just to break into with a good idea that might have a sample size of one, which is uh, my fan experience. And it might not be um, necessarily representative of a, a large swath of NBA fans or specific usage of fans on Sunday for an NFL game. Yeah, well, I see startups they'll come in and say, this is a really innovative ticketing thing. Can you introduce me to certain teams? And I say, well, actually, they have Ticketmaster right. relationships, and that's locked in for five years. So I, much as you've got a great technology, you have to look elsewhere. And that, to what extent are the roles of the leagues, like you're both in clubs, mm -hmm. uh, the NBA has just, uh, as of November last year, made one of our MBAs, head of chief innovation, innovation officer, which is one of the first leagues to actually have Amy. Yeah. And so to what extent are the leagues at head office uh, helping? Because I know the NFL has got really good people uh, at looking at this. And the MBAs yeah. in a world, they're really advanced, aren't they? Yeah, and, and Amy Brooks, who you just mentioned, she uh, was recently promoted to Chief Innovation Officer at the MBA on top of her job as, um, as Senior Vice President of uh, a group um, that's kind of legendary in the sports world called TeamBo, which stands for Team Marketing and Business Operations. And the MBA was one of the first leagues to, to create this group, which basically just went around to share knowledge between all 30 teams in the league. And so we uh, get together multiple times per year um, as all uh, 30 teams teams get together, but then also we have a dedicated team bow rep who comes and spends time with us uh, once every few months and takes knowledge from the Lakers, from the Knicks, from the Milwaukee Bucks, from the Chicago Bulls, from the Miami Heat. Here's what they're doing well, and here's how it could apply to our business. And so that's, that's at, I think, at a high, le a high level. But also, um, one of the things I love about the NBA is we have a, an NBA digital Slack channel. Um, with all 30 teams on it. And so when we post, hey, did this company reach out to you? Um, oh, this company works with this team. Hey, my friend from the Thunder, um, what's your experience been like? So the MBA is so collaborative. The one thing I say on, is- on, on the business side, that's what I was not gonna so say. much on the we're, playing side. We're collaborative off the court. <laughs> yeah, on the court, I don't talk to my friends uh, from the Cavs during yeah. the playoffs or from uh, yeah. Toronto during the playoffs. <laughs> Uh, but off the off the court, you know, the way we look at it is we're all there to grow the game yeah. and the league and the sport. And so the more that we can help each other, you know, we're not necessarily always competing when it comes to technology with the Miami Heat, right? It's a completely different market, completely different city. But if we can combine our forces together and do something really powerful, that's a win-win. And so that's what I think the NBA has done a really good job of. And, and I know the NFL does a lot of great work. I think there's also a ton of, Bruno mentioned, we probably talk to the 49ers weekly. There's also a ton of sharing between leagues and teams as well, yeah. not just within the NBA, but NFL, NHL, MLB, um, even internationally um, with the Premier League and La Liga and the Australian Football League. So there's a ton of knowledge sharing within sports. Yeah. Bruno, in terms of what would be examples of the NFL um, sort of linking up in terms of back and forth with you in terms of technology? Um, 
it, 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 it goes back kind of team to team um, level, um, perhaps element of us being in the Silicon Valley and having the team that we do from the ownership all the way down. Yeah. Um, we're pretty steeped in technology and, and I think one of the questions is going to be barriers to, to entry for, for new technologies. The kind of the, the ability to take in um, a new, new piece of technology, not just evaluate it, but then deploy it and yeah. evaluate it uh, in the real world um, is not trivial, right? It yeah. requires a number of folks inside the organization that are not really technologists, yeah. but are willing to at least try and, 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 and think about um, different ways that they can you know, make themselves better. Um, you know, we have you know, in, informal calls with, uh, with the league office pretty much on an ongoing basis. They're doing a lot around um, you know, digital as well, mm -hmm. uh, trying to, again, imagine what the fandom looks like, um, how the viewership is going to uh, perform going forward, um, a lot of different you know, digital initiatives. Um, most of the most of the team is based in LA, um, and and you know, there's a lot of collaboration in a kind of really real time basis. Yeah, the the, the NFL had traditionally been headquartered in New York and still is, but LA is very much where the NFL media and right. uh, the digital unit is. And and actually, one of the interesting things in the sports industry is they're attracting people to work in those digital ventures that historically have not got what you would call 100% devotion to sports. They may be much more devoted to technology, so it makes it very hard to necessarily keep those people when Disney and other people are bidding for exactly the same talent, especially when ESPN Plus and those people start rolling out their, um, uh, their implementation. Um, in areas of new technology, what, what are the areas of new tech, areas of sports do you see really impactful in terms of technologies? Just one or two that you would say more than less than you've observed. Yeah, I think Brano mentioned this earlier, but content, yeah. I think that's something that I think is on everyone's mind in the world mm -hmm. of sports, especially as that world is just changing so much. Um, I think we're all just um, trying to figure out how exactly it affects us and, and how it will evolve. And so, um, you know, obviously streaming is, is a big uh, conversation. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the NBA around uh, streaming and international and league pass and things like that. And so that's a big conversation. Um, even our local TV partners, NBC Sports Bay Area, they have an app called My Teams, um, which combines uh, content from all the Bay Area teams that they have rights to where you can watch content from a single app across all Bay Area teams. And so talking to them about how they think about content and, and the future of that content. So I think content is, is number one. Um, Sports betting has been a big conversation, yeah. I think, over the last uh, few years, especially, uh, you know, we're waiting in California for, for it to be legal, uh, but we're definitely keeping an eye on, on what other teams. I think um, there's a few teams that have started playing around with uh, alternative broadcasts. Um, the Washington Wizards are, are one of them where they have, uh, they're an NBC uh, sports team as well, and so on NBC Sports uh, Plus in their market, they have an enhanced viewing experience that shows um, the over-under and real-time uh, lines. Um, so really looking at what other teams are doing where um, sports betting is legal and, and trying to figure out how will that affect our business. Um, and I think the third thing is just now that we're an owner operator of uh, 11 acres of land, how do we just make sure that we're maximizing the potential? And so we're constantly looking at everything from real estate to, um, to uh, different camera systems. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on, uh, but really just trying to understand what's happening in the world and what are companies like Disney doing or Universal because they have obviously a ton of, uh, they have plenty of acres of, of space. Mm -hmm. How are they, what are they doing to maximize food and beverage, retail? All those different things. That's something that we're constantly thinking about as well. Yeah. If, if you sort of take the, the gambling area, innovations are not just based in the US. A lot of the uh, gambling is being legal in other countries, England especially, and there's some very big gambling companies that are deep-ended technology. And so they've started to come into the US in the last 10 years, and, and they are really advanced within what we call within-game betting which is one of the ways at which people are getting excited about keep the audience, even in a blowout game. Tracy, you wanted to talk about the broader world of sports on this question, well, right? I, I think uh, sometimes we think about sports and we sort of fixate on the stick-in-the-ball sports and the ones that are played in this country. 
But if we look at the, the landscape more broadly, there's so many different types of sports, but wherever they are, they are content factories. And so you've heard this term over and over again tonight, and sport really has that attention-grabbing, must-see element to it. And I think there's also increased expectations by the fans that uh, expect the teams that they follow to follow them and keep them apprised of whether it's injury reports or a schedule change or a lineup announcement for a particular matchup or, or whatever it might be. I, I, I do believe that uh, these mobile devices that we can't live without, uh, I, I remember when they first were proliferating, they were referred to as the remote controls of our lives. And I think as a sports fan, um, one of the things that we've definitely seen advancements is the the, uh, how robust the technology is in the venue to make sure that live experience uh, delivers on that promise. When you spend a lot of money and sometimes you take a lot of time to get to a game and you finally get there, uh, the last thing that you would want is for that fan not to stay connected when they're actually in your own home. And so um, the venue technology uh, makes these buildings very uh, responsive, of course. Uh, there was a new bar set with 9-11 and some of the big um, uh, the problems that we've had in global sports um, with hooliganism and, and some of the, the horrific bombings that have taken place. So venue security has really put everybody on notice and technology has really made some strides. We look at you know the clear technology that gets us into the airplane uh, or airports. Um, that's used in sports venues all over the place. Facial recognition to track the people on the on the uh, do not enter enter list um, in certain venues, but also things like being responsive to building automations and programming a venue so that you can have multiple events going on at the same time. It used to be one size fits all, and now we're seeing venues literally having four or five different things going on, and it might not be the core tenant. The, the, the sports team might not even be playing that, that day, but there's lots of other corporate events and, um, and uh, product launches and celebrations, and so uh, these venues are hyper uh, in hyper use all the time, and the technology needs to respond to the different use cases of the people that are in it at any given time. Bruno, you, if I remember, between the uh, triathlons and the <laughs> ventures that you were doing, you had like 40 ventures that you... Uh, uh, talk a little bit about the ventures at which you're putting quite a bit of money in, because I know we spoke before and you, you get inundated with AI ventures, and that's not necessarily where a lot of the money in your portfolio is going, is yeah, it? Yeah, AI is tough, obviously, is a buzzword now, and um, <laughs> I personally have a little bit of a negative uh, reaction whenever I see a pitch deck that has bunch of buzzwords like machine learning and, and AI. Uh, AI is tough for us um, for one specific reason, um, the, which is the, this, quite frankly, um, scarcity of games. Um, yeah. our, our league, as you know, and our, our sport is limited in terms of how many um, games we play. Unlike, you know, one end you have obviously baseball that just generates a lot of information yeah. from the players, from the TVs, um, it's much more, I wouldn't say control sport, but it's, it's much more set. Um, we don't have that, right? So the data set that um, we have to work with is, is pretty limited. Um, mm -hmm. It's large, but for the, for the good AI and machine learning algorithm, you need literally tens of millions of data points to be able to actually train those. We don't have that yet, right? Um, so, so AI, we haven't done much there. Um, the, you know, we, we look at a space a little bit perhaps more as a traditional venture capital firm from the direct investment opportunities, um, generally focus on, on, on consumer-centric um, mm -hmm. opportunities, because we are and always will be at the core um, of, again, professional sports franchise, but we're also a consumer brand, right? And as you start thinking about your organization that way, um, that's kind of wrapped into entertainment brand, um, it really starts to open a lot of opportunities in terms of where we feel we can add value um, and we try to present ourselves as a very much strategic investor um, as a matter of practice um, and, and thesis. We'll, we will not be a passive investor sitting on the back of cap table yeah. writing checks. That's just a Makes no winning, sense. Winning, uh, winning combination. We, we're not going to compete on you know, capital. There's a lot of it around here. So, um, so we're looking for those opportunities. Whenever I see some opportunity comes through, one of the first or last uh, things that we look at is this prism of, okay, how can we help? What can we do to inflect the growth mm -hmm. to help companies grow, whether it's on Twitter, on the, in the product, um, to 
to help expose to you know universe of folks that we operate with through you know targeted introductions to ecosystem, and generally we look at opportunities that clearly has application in sports, uh, but really only as a first step. Uh, I think yeah. it's no secret that sports entertainment is a large market, but it's finite. Yeah. Right, as a venture investor, very much looking at the traditional element, we look for those high risk, high reward opportunities where companies can scale the billion dollars in yeah. valuation and hundreds of millions of revenues. You know, outside of some of the OTT stuff and, and maybe some of the consumer kind of digital platforms, there are not that many opportunities really that, that can hit that scale. Um, the path of addressing the elite performance teams, to going into the mass consumer, that path is not trivial. And there's not too many companies that were able to actually uh, successfully navigate. Um, so, so that's where we always take a view around what is the true market size as an investment. Now, we will we'll take a look at companies and, and push it through our internal organization that perhaps can help us do job better, but it may not hit the kind of investment threshold. So again, we'll work for those. We tend to be a little bit of a kind of gatekeeper in terms of um, flowing those through internally. Uh, but um, again, market size become, a, become an issue. Yeah, I mean, I think if you looked at the professional teams, the professional teams have traditionally done sponsorship deals where the sponsors pay them. And if you come and say, we expect you to pay them, they say, actually, we deposit checks. We don't write checks if you, <laughs> you get out grift. And, and so I think that's, I've seen that several times where it's really exciting to the team. And then they say, how much will you pay for us to be a use case? And they say, well, actually, we were thinking the reverse of payment stream as it doesn't work that way in, at the elite sports level. And some clubs do. Uh, Daniel, um, this one at which, uh, right to your heart, eSports mm -hmm. uh, is just an amazing takeoff at the moment in terms of dollars going into it, new venues being built. Um, what, what sort of uh, vetting are you doing and, and what areas are you investing in eSports? Yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, hot topic uh, across the industry and, and one that we dove into a few years ago. Um, we actually own two esports teams. Um, we own the Golden Guardians, who play uh, in the North America Championship Series in League of Legends. Uh, and then the, uh, in the NBA 2K League, which is the NBA's uh, esports league for the uh, video game 2K, we have the Warriors Gaming Squad. And so we have kind of dove head in uh, and, and really, um, it's been pretty fascinating um, coming from being in kind of the more traditional sports world to seeing this, this world that's changing by the day um, where the rules are kind of new, the rules are still being written. Um, and meanwhile, we play in sports where the rules have been written for many, many years. And, um, you know, it takes a lot to change the rules. Uh, so it's been really, really interesting. Um, you know, for us, the, we, we look at it in a few different ways. So one is um, it's a whole new market um, that may not traditionally be watching uh, basketball, for example, uh, but it's a way for them to still engage with our brand. And so I think as, as we, again, evolve from just uh, being a basketball team to really a sports entertainment organization, you know, we have uh, the Golden State Warriors, we have the Santa Cruz Warriors, which is our uh, G League team down in Santa Cruz. We obviously have Chase Center, but now we have two additional brands that make up the Warriors family um, that aren't necessarily played in a indoor venue that seats 18,000, um, but could be played anywhere in the world, online, uh, across many different age groups. And so for us, it was a really interesting opportunity to really um, explore a world that uh, is, is really changing rapidly. And I think for us, we also saw an opportunity to bring a lot of our expertise and knowledge that, that we've gained in operating uh, these traditional sports teams to a world that, again, is still so new that can we help the industry think a little bit more about how corporate sponsorship is done, or how marketing partnerships are done, or how uh, you think about content? And so um, that's been a really, really interesting um, venture for us that we've um, gotten into over the last few years. And um, if any of you are in LA, I highly recommend that you go um, to the LCS Arena um, and check out, uh, it's Saturdays and Sundays typically, uh, and watch uh, these incredible athletes uh, play these games, which I'm sure th those who have kids have probably seen their kids play video games. Um, and it's pretty incredible seeing how good some of these kids, uh, some of these young uh, adults are. 
There's a proposal that um, esports be in the NCA curriculum, and one of the problems is we have a 20 hour restriction per week uh, on our athletes can play. I think they do 20 hours a day on some of these games. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the one of the measures of the strength of this, and again, for those that might not realize, esports is watching other people play video games, and uh, this has uh, just become it'll be a 1.5 billion dollar market here in another two three years. It's exploding, and um, viewership is is just staggering. I mean, 650 million viewers by 2025. I mean, these these are numbers that are just um, significant in ways that the traditional sports could only. Only dream of and so it's really put some pressure on on traditional sports but it's also created some unique opportunities and and the demographic of esports is is uh, what many of the the traditional broadcasters would love to have um, esports suggests a blend of lifestyle and culture and entertainment and competitive sports but make no mistake these are athletes there's a uh, they have agents there's drug testing there's um, sports performance and uh, nutrition coaches and I mean it is exactly what uh, the marquee athletes that play on, on these teams uh, enjoy and it's just that they're you know largely teenagers early 20 somethings that have a tremendous following on these live streaming um, and influencer platforms so it, it's a compelling uh, new entrant and I'm I'm reminded by the, the title of this event, and I would say eSports is ruling the, the, the new way to play. And just to give, sorry, yeah, George, don't. really quick, but just to give an example, um, our, our structure with um, the Golden Guardians is on the coaching side is we have a head coach, assistant coaches, we have a performance coach. Those are roles that exist right. on the Golden State Warriors coaching staff. Yeah. And right. so it's really interesting uh, seeing uh, these two worlds, but what also brings them together is the same thing. These are still athletes. They still need to make sure that they go and work out and they, they eat the right foods and they get enough sleep. I mean, it's a lot of the same conversations that we're having with our, our NBA players that we are having with our League of Legends players. Yeah, and it could be groups too. I mean, the dominant uh, is 80% male at the moment. 12 to 28 average age group, so it's it's a very different graphic. Bruno, just the Tracy, interest. Go on, I was going to say, uh, I knew we'd reached a point of no return when on the uh, entry application, the visa application. There's a box you can check that says professional gamer. Yeah. So. Yeah. Esports Bruno, is not going away. Bruno, in the interest of uh, just moving our own questions, uh, one hot area is data analytics, and. Um, if we looked on the playing side or the business side, you can take your choice. What do you see in differences across clubs in terms of the investment in analytics, yeah. the number of people, the sort of people they're hiring? Because there's just tremendous differences that I see. Yeah, I'll, I'll go quickly. The way that we look at our business is, well, business side and football side should be probably self-explanatory, but the business side is really anything that touches our fans in the venue or at home. Football is anything that touches our players. And we have essentially business analytics teams covering both pretty related but separate type of uh, mm -hmm. type of activities. Um, on the business side, really briefly, this concept and really a holy grail of, of 360 view uh, of the fan, right? Um, uh, Dan was mentioning a little bit about how do we maximize um, our fan experience. Increasingly, it's becoming clear that it's through analytics and through technology. Um, Ticket is a great anonymizer. Um, you lose um, a view of your fan once that ticket goes out because it can be transferred freely, resold, etc. So how do we continue to capture that information to serve our fans better? Um, and look on the team side. Similarly, um, you know, uh, I think there's more and more um, initiatives and understanding that technology and specifically data. Uh, is a, is a key element of, of, uh, of performance. I think, again, we're getting to a place, certainly since I started in the last five years working for a sports franchise, the, um, the granularity of the information that we're able to get from the players is getting finer and finer and better and better to a point where incremental data, again, is becoming, there's a little bit of a diminishing return. The big question and where I always like to um, to ask questions when we see the companies, and, and if anybody here is working on one, is this holy grail, so what? Or, you know, can you help me generate actionable insight? What does this big Excel spreadsheet, what does it tell me, right? How can I act on this data mm -hmm. in a very simple, straightforward way? Because you also have to remember that people that are 
responsible are not necessarily technologists. They don't come from technology ecosystem. And if you drop a big you know, CSV file or some large regression model that shows you know, multi-dimensional variables, like you're going to lose them really quickly, right? So that, that, that actionable insights um, that companies are able to generate from the various sensors that are getting smaller and smaller and better and better is, uh, is, is getting increasingly, increasingly more, more important. Daniel and then Tracy. Daniel, in terms of uh, data analytics, you are, as an organization, at the forefront, but you're also at the forefront of a league that's really driving the, the area, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and for us, you know, analytics has gotten that much more important because, again, I, I feel like I'm hammering this point home, but we're not just a basketball team anymore. We have a lot of um, interesting, actionable data on basketball fans, our Warriors fans who have been coming to games for, for decades. Um, but now we're in this new world of you're coming to eat at one of the restaurants that's open at Thrive City or you're coming to a concert. That data, we don't have a ton of data yet. And so right now we're, we're still in the process of, of really building out um, kind of that, what Brano mentioned is that 360 degree view of the fan, really trying to understand when George Foster comes to Chase Center, what is he like? What kind of food do you like? What kind of music do you like? So that we can give you the best experience possible. Uh, but I think Brano made a really, really good point. Capturing the data is really easy. Yeah. You, can, you can get data from anywhere. It's how do you act on it? That is really, I think, the, the secret sauce. And that's where you know, our analytics team spends a lot of time looking at the data, but also trying to figure out what are those insights. And so whether it's you know, what entrance people are coming into the venue, does that mean we need to staff more people here? Or can we even um, move people to other spaces? Or you know, this uh, concession stand, you know, this, these menu items um, are being bought more than these. Do we need to rethink the menu? I mean, all those different things. Capturing, again, capturing the data is really easy these days. Um, it's more what can you do with it that, that answers those questions, so what? And I think that's what we're um, starting to, to do a lot more on the, on the entertainment side. Um, we've done a pretty good job on the basketball side, um, but there's still so much that we could do. Tracy, when, when you see proposals coming in, um, how do you sort of coach people in terms of making presentations of this is not just a data dump, that they've got to relate to a GM, relate to a, sure. a chief revenue officer? How do you? Well, I can think of uh, several examples where I've, I've harnessed my uh, fandom with the 49ers. I've been a season ticket holder for uh, a couple of decades now. and being able to look at the data trail that I actually freely provide, um, whether it's by my, and I'm very predictable, just like athletes have their routine, fans have their routines. And for many, many years, I've, I've driven and I've parked kind of in the same place and I certainly purchase the same type of refreshments, um, call it. <laughs> um, but I also um, have you know, seats that I tend to you know, use season after season and, uh, and whether I go to the store certain times or other times or visit the museum in the case of Levi's, um, am I go going with corporate guests? Am I going um, and tailgating? I mean, these are all types of data points that, that are available. So there's an avalanche. There's no shortage of data. But again, how can the 49ers take that data and make uh, the experience of either me as a fan or the, the companies that I might be engaged with um, make, make that meaningful? And I, I also encourage them to look, certainly ROI rules the day, but there's also ROE, uh, returns on experience. And we all uh, know that what a bad experience means, and uh, sometimes we, we show that with uh, our purchasing patterns or our, our loyalty to a certain brand. And so uh, I know, having worked in sports for now three decades, I'm able to work with early stage companies to really stress test um, what they think their solution might bring to, to these, these gentlemen and their organizations. And, and, and then double click and, and ask really what, what we can solve uh, and make sure that's a meaningful, um, meaningful and relevant to your particular business model or sport or fans. I think, sorry, George, really quick. I think Tracy made um, a really, really important point, which is the experience. I think one of the biggest shifts in the industry that has happened is that it's no longer just about the game itself. That's obviously still the main thing, but your transportation experience, your food and beverage experience, those now make up your entire game day experience. And so we now, as uh, teams, need to think about 
What are we doing on the food and beverage side? What are we doing on the transportation side? Is your ingress and egress getting in and out of the building? What's that experience like? Because all of those little things make up now what is your experience. And so that's something that we're now thinking a lot more about, uh, which I think has shifted, uh, especially as digital and technology has become um, that much more important, is that it's not just about the three hours that the game is played. Obviously, that's, that's the most important thing. That's why you're coming. But the food and beverage, you know, is the type of wine that you like to drink or the type of beer that you like to drink, is that available? Is the type of food that you want, is that there? You know, those are now becoming more and more important to the overall game day experience. And uh, Brano, when you look across the league itself, and you see differences in, say, the way coaches or GMs or players take advice from analytics. How do, you, how do you sort of, what sort of changes do you see so that, you know, whether you call it old world coaches, new world coaches, or some players are fairly negative on yeah, stats? Yeah, uh, I, I can speak to other teams, obviously, but I will tell you that there's a clear shift in understanding that this is a, a, a valuable tool. Um, and our league, like, like a lot, uh, like all the other leagues um, and teams, there's a significant, I don't want to say copycatting, but like if it works for one team, it's going to be pretty quickly adopted across the entire entire league. Yeah. Um, we are very collaborative, and I didn't appreciate that before I started uh, working with an organization on the business side. Right, concept of a home market is wonderful because we don't really compete for other other teams' fans. Um, so if it's something that works for me, I think mm -hmm. Daniel mentioned. Um, you know, we, we happen and we speak to half a dozen, dozen different NFL franchises where we, we try to be helpful because, you know, the, the high tide lift all the boats at that point. Um, the closer to Sunday we get, the, clo the more difficult those chats become, obviously. But um, the, um, you know, the people are adopting more and more. There's a little bit of a organizational inertia uh, where you have certain individuals and teams that have done certain things for 20, 30 years. So introducing new kind of technologies, really new business rules that carry, mm -hmm. that come with the technology that you deploy. Um, it, it's, not, it's not easy, right? I, yeah. Again, I'm, I'm lucky to be part of the, of the franchise that is very comfortable with trying new things and understand that um, you know, this can help us and let's try it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, we're going to try to improve it and, and move on and continue to, uh, to be exposed to to what again we're lucky to be exposed to given given where we are where we're located but it, it's it's uh, I think it's, it's inevitable that technology is going to continue to seep into the, the sports like it has in a lot of other industries that historically have not uh, been part of it and I think just as uh, the fans put some pressure on the any organization it could be a hotel it could be an airline it could be a restaurant it could be a professional sports team to, to stay current and to deliver on a personalized experience and keep them safe. And, and uh, I, I do also think that these athletes that are playing uh, professional sports now, they've grown up. They're digital natives. They're fluent in you know, gaming technology. They're fluent with you know, tablets and looking at plays on, you know, it's no longer you know, the, the quarterback on the, on the sideline looking at a, a digital camera or a, an actual photograph. Um, these athletes also put pressure, you know, from from the the team itself onto the coaches, which then um, raises the bar raises the bar that way. So I, I do see a lot of comp um, complementary forces at play in sport that's very healthy. And Daniel, in, do you see differences amongst players in terms of the way they sort of like if somebody? I mean, I, I'm talking to one of the NBA athletes, and he was complaining the fact that analytics said that he shouldn't be shooting that much. He should be defending more. And he said, well, you're taking away half the fun of my game. And they said, just, just defend. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's the sort of thing that, you know, the analytics was saying one thing where his heart was saying something else. How do you, how do you sort of handle those challenges as, a, as sort of providing information to a coach or a GM as it's supposed to execute on those things? Yeah, so I, I think the... Um I think the most important thing is, is when you can take the experience that someone like Steve Kerr has, who won five championships as a player, has been a broadcaster, has been a GM, and 
his gut and intuition and all that knowledge that he has and the data are saying the same thing. And when you can combine those two forces together, yeah. that's when I think people really buy into the, the power of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're so lucky, I think to, to Brano's point, you know, we have incredible ownership starting with Joe Lacob and Peter Guber, um, going all the way down to, to Bob Myers, our president of basketball operations and general manager, Rick Welts, our, our president and COO, um, Steve Kerr, our head coach. I mean, just such incredible people who um, they value other people's opinion. They value what everyone does in the organization. And so they'll listen because you could find you know, that one little nugget that could change everything. I think there's a story um, in the 2015 championship when um, someone uh, on our coaching staff, Nikki Red, made a suggestion to Coach Kerr that, hey, maybe uh, in game six we should start uh, Andre Godala. Um, and look what happened. So you, you never know when, when that little nugget will come from. It could come from the, the 30 or 40 years of experience you have playing the game, or it could come from the numbers. But when those two worlds come together and say the same message, then that's, I think, when uh, the, the possibilities are limitless. OK. I'm going to fold in some of the questions from the audience in a, in, with some of the others. But one of the questions is, how is the use of tech in other business areas changing sports? So for instance, the, uh, what I'd call the dynamic pricing for tickets really comes out of the airline and the hotel industry and then starts moving into the sporting industry. What would be examples, uh, Bruno, of, uh, just to go down the line on this, of where well, some technology outside the sporting yeah. industry gets in idea transfer, technology import, whatever you want to call it? I like the, the, uh, the example of airline, and I use the same for slightly different use case. Um, I think we're going, I mean, more and more into the um, paperless, cashless stadiums. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure you all have traveled in, in your uh, line of work, and I remember in, in my old days, I used to hop on planes, and I think it was Continental that first introduced the concept of an app or, or a, a ticket that you can actually download on your phone. Um, it was so novel that I remember for months I would download it, but then I would print it at home just in case. <laughs> um, well, I don't remember last time I printed my airline ticket. It's probably has been a decade at this point. We're moving towards that direction in, in sports as well. And what does that allow you to obviously get much better experience coming in? It's much more secure. There's some even some great technology we're seeing uh, coming through where you literally can just wave your hand over a reader. It's a speed. Uh, you know, capture camera that, that captures your essentially fingertips. So you yourself, if you wish, become a ticket, um, which, is, which is fascinating, right, in terms of just the throughput and, and how secure and, and how great the experience becomes. Um, similarly, on the, on, the, on the cash side, right, um, operationally, cash is not great, right? I mean, you all have been to the to games, and back in the 1920s, you used to go and probably still wait in lines to get your hot dog while well, you're still doing that today, right? There's no real reason technology is mm -hmm. there to yeah. allow you to, to kind of eliminate that. Um, but when we launched at Levi's, we had a concept of express pickups where you could essentially pre-order all your food. And um, you know the only thing you would need to do is show your phone with a QR code, and your, your order was already there waiting for you, right? Well, <laughs> we had these lines allocated, and I would walk the you know, concessions, and and everybody would see the regular lines that were 30 deep, and there was nobody at the express lines. And people would have their app in the line, uh, and kind of like, oh, this is kind of neat. So I would go and ask him, like, well, don't you realize that you could actually literally just go on right there, five inches away, and just yeah. pick up your food? And the look that I would see at people's faces is one of, well, I've been waiting for my hot dog for 10 years. That's what I do, <laughs> right? Um, so it's going to take a while, right, on both, both ends. But I think it's, it's changing more and more, right? We're, we're going to go into much more of a kind of personalized experience that, that's going to, technology is going to be able to take away a lot of kind of major pain points that, that we've historically associated going to live events. Tracy? Yeah, I can, I can certainly speak to the experience Bruno's describing. Think about restaurants, you know, when you get the, you check in and then you get the little tile that buzzes when your, your seats, uh, table's ready. Um, that's now possible uh, at a sports venue with uh, some good AI and some good ticket or um, uh, concessions uh, data and we all have the buzzer already with us. And so there's ways that the sports experience can layer 
in other, other uses of technology that uh, might seem a little analog, but in a sport, crowded sports venue, a, a pickup line is, um, the, the beer's going to stay cold and the food's going to stay hot. I also think uh, we mentioned you know, clear, letting venue, uh, people into venues, just like at, at airplanes. Uh, I, th I think that there's um, uh, the hospitality industry and the hotel industry has really changed the way some of these luxury suites uh, are being configured, designed, and obviously monetized. So why can't you have your family photos there in the digital frames at a luxury suite or corporate photos if it's a, a corporate space? Um, so that personalization can be enabled through technology. And you know, you might have a, a, a photo uh, frame in, in grandmother's home of the new grandchild. Why, why can't you ex export some of that experience in other parts of our lives into the sporting venue, into the sporting experience? I think Chase is just beyond imagination of what you've done with the boxes there. Isn't yeah. it? Do you want to just talk about Salesforce and without, without mentioning any companies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, you know, we have what I, I'm, of course, a little biased, I would say, but uh, some of the most beautiful premium hospitality spaces um, in the industry. And um, one of my favorite parts in, in some of our suites is we have wireless chargers in every single suite. And uh, as we were thinking, you know, one, one of my biggest fears um, during the construction and design of Chase Center was you open and all, all of a sudden something is out of date. And so we're, during the construction and design process, we're constantly thinking about, well, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of what's next? And so we saw um, as uh, Apple and, and, and other uh, companies were um, you know, introducing wireless charging to their devices, that we saw as a trend that was going to continue. And so we decided that we were going to put four wireless chargers into every single uh, suite um, at Chase Center. And so um, we've, we've done that. Um, we also, with our partner Fanatics, who, who runs the Warrior Shop, um, you can also do in-suite uh, retail delivery. So you can order, um, whether it's a Warriors jersey or a hat or a scarf or whatever it is, and someone will come and deliver it to your suite. Um, and so we're, we're always thinking about how do we enhance the experience. And so th those are two uh, little things that, that we've done. OK. Here's a question. Um, what about extending advanced health monitoring for amateurs, especially concussion and other areas? So the impact of technology on, on what I call the, some people call it the bottom of the pyramid, the, the kids going up to the uh, Pop Warner or whatever the other names of the leagues are before you even get to college, which is where a huge number of kids are. What sort of, where do you see any, any of the proposals coming through to you, Bruno, in terms of looking at uh, what I call amateur uh, sports? Well, we, um, for us at least, and anything health related by definition is addressed and really worked on in a pretty major way at the league level. Um, the, um, whether it's through technology or just new, new ways that, that you coach how to play sports, the whole heads up um, approach, then that has to start at the, at the at quite frankly, bottom of the, of the you know, pyramid, the very, very start. So, um, look, it's no secret that um, organization, the league as a whole, primarily has, has dedicated a lot of resources and effort to make sure mm -hmm. that the sport is as safe as possible. Um, for, for the health and safety of the players. Um, so uh, that's just an ongoing, ongoing process. We're certainly not there yet, but I, I think if you just look at the numbers of concussions and um, what's happened over the last three, four years, um, we made a significant improvement, but clearly there's still more work to do. Tracy, do you, in, in terms of um, amateurs, uh, what are sort of the proposals do, that you're seeing? Cause sure. Sure, and also at the collegiate space, that's a, it's a really important farm system, if you will, for a lot of the professional leagues. They look at the collegiate space. There's some uh, work coming out of universities that's it's really, really strong when it comes to uh, health and wellness of athletes because they're student athletes. And so sleep takes on a, a, a new level of importance when they're supposed to be students and athletes. And so uh, that's one of the areas where a lot of research, um, and I would uh, salute the Pac-12 with some of the work that they've done, the investments they've made to keep the, the athletes' uh, health and wellness a, a, a key priority. Uh, as far as youth sports, 
uh, there, there's obviously tremendous, we talked about the bottom of the pyramid, uh, globally the, the tens of millions of, of athletes that play youth sports. Um, we're really seeing a lot of importing of things like the, the uh, uh, Fitbits and some of the technologies where, where tracking is used and biometric data is, is now being produced to help monitor uh, those young athletes uh, from overuse. And, uh, and, and that's a really key, uh, important indicator to keep them safe for the longe longevity of their careers. So that's another example where um, athlete tracking data, and sleep data, and actual just coaching where they can uh, have access to the technology on a, on a tablet or some sort of mobile device uh, helps them learn the rules, helps them prepare for the next game. Um, it also helps them in the case that they're injured, they can still stay abreast of what the, what the team is doing on the field. So there's a lot of those types of consumer technologies that are totally relevant for the youth sports market. Price points are low and you know, content is, is pretty ubiquitous. Just in terms of um, having a variety of questions answered, Daniel, one of the questions relates to um, how is a sports content being curated different for di across different generations, millennials, those type of things? Because, I mean, I think it is fair comment to say, uh, if, if I look at my class, I asked how many of them watch television at night? I mean, two out of 60, and they were the seniors in the room. Um, literally, it's, 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 it's a huge change. What, how are you seeing you change, using technologies to better capture the mind shares of 15-year-olds to 25-year-olds? Yeah, so I think um, there's two words that come to mind. One is personalization, and then the other is context. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do with, uh, with the Warriors app is um, really figure out what do you like? And I'll use you as an example, George. So if you're a fan of Stephen Curry, and we know that, we should be showing you more Stephen Curry content in your content feed in the yeah. Warriors uh, Chase Center app. Draymond Green, actually. Draymond Green it is then. Lots of blocks and dunks for you then. So um, that's one of the things that we're constantly trying to do is, is how do we personalize each experience for each individual fan? I think uh, we've done a really good job of creating content for the masses, whether it's through traditional broadcast television. But now that... Um, we're, we're able to capture so much more data. I mentioned earlier being able to capture what your favorite food is, your type of music. We also know probably who your favorite player is. So can we start delivering you those types of yeah. uh, highlights, whether it's during the game, after the game, knowing that type of information? And so there's actually a company we work with um, called WSC, which is an AI-based uh, video creation tool where they can tag every single play in real time. So it knows Stephen Curry made this three-pointer. We have now this uh, data feed of every single play that has happened in a game, and we're now displaying that content in our app. So now the, the problem isn't getting that content, yeah. it's knowing that George's favorite player is Draymond Green and displaying that content just for George. And so that's really that personalization and that context that um, I think we're, we're gonna be working towards for a while, but we're, we're well on our way. Hey, Tracy, in terms of the millennial conception of sports and its differences. Absolutely. Um, some sports are in, on the brink of extinction because the, the millennial audience just will not go to those games uh, live, much less watch them on television. So there's, uh, there's a constant pressure to make these bite-sized, snackable pieces of, of sport, and that's where the social media really comes in, and I think the players themselves start to see them as content factories, and they can, they can communicate directly to their audience, and, uh, and that's where brands really take hold. The sponsors of these teams and uh, the, the sponsors of these athletes in some cases really harness that one-to-one -one communication that the athletes have with the fans through social platforms and even product launches and announcements of maybe a, a new opening in a, a restaurant or something in a local market. Um, fans expect to have that dialogue and they expect that their celebrity athletes will respond to them. So I, I think there's some, some healthy enabling technologies that bridge that gap, especially with a younger demographic. Bruno, in terms of... Um yeah, I don't know much to add other than um, it probably follows the overall kind of cultural phenomenon of attention spans getting smaller and smaller, shorter and shorter, right? Um, the the prol proliferation of content to begin with, um, um, the competition for eyeballs comes from every which way. Um, so um, I think the concept of highlights and having these, as Tracy put it, I think snackable is a, is a really good, good way to 
to you know describe it, and then you have to start thinking about okay, how do we actually monetize that in this new world of of content that's that's much more bite size um, and available across multiple um, you know you know platform where you're trying to reach your fan whatever they are, and which is increasingly um, on the go. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Tracy mentioned sports that are challenging. Golf, I think, is is not helping themselves. I know if you go to Augusta, you have to put your you can't take your mobile phone onto the course. Well, that's like taking a, an arm off some of the, <laughs> some people. Anyway, it just doesn't happen. And, and then there's other golf courses say you can't take photos on the course because we've got rights on photos to, given to a sponsor. Well, again, the millennial's going to say, what do you mean? That's what I do. I, Instagram wouldn't exist without my photos. <laughs> so I think that's the sort of thing that sports have got to realise that this world is not made for a generation that was two years two decades ago on that. Um, here's a question. How do you see social media playing a role in the consuming of sports? It's become one of the most important parts, I think, of our, of our business. Um, as our game has grown globally, um, social media is what connects us to basketball fans all over the world. It's no longer just the 18,000 people that are there for the game. Those little moments, those snackable moments are now being consumed all over the world um, in different languages. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible um, what social media has done. Um, I mean, we're, uh, the, the last question had me thinking um, about TikTok, which is a platform that uh, we've recently gone on and now have over a million followers on TikTok. I mean, it, it's incredible what these platforms have done to really eliminate uh, physical barriers. It almost feels like you're, you're in the same place as where the play happens, even though you could be living mm -hmm. on the other side of the world. I, I really believe social media um, is one of the biggest uh, growth drivers for sports. Um, it has been and will continue to be in the future. But you mean, two years ago, TikTok wasn't on the radar no. screen. And, and, so that, and that's the, the crazy thing about this world is that um, these these platforms change so quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, at one point, Snapchat is really, really hot, and then not so hot, and now it's back to being really hot, and now TikTok is yeah. in, and then Vine was really hot, and then Twitter, you know, integrated Vine into yeah. the Twitter app, and so it's constantly Vine. changing. We have a, a five-person social media team that this is all they do every single day, is look at these platforms and how do you create content for those platforms. That's different than broadcast television or even the in-game uh, scoreboard feed. Yeah. It's all so different different and so you know cutting highlights that are square instead of you know rectangular I mean yeah. it's, it's pretty incredible just how much thought has to go into each one of those yeah. things yeah one of the most amazing things about my job is that I get to work with 15, 18 to 25 year old the best kids in the world and it's like a continue every, every class of continuing education for me yep on that Brano in terms of what about social media how yeah, it's, it's the way that your fans increasingly uh, interact with your brand, right? Um, yeah. That's the one or few channels that you use to, to reach um, your, your fans. You know, our stadium is a little bit bigger, but, you know, roughly speaking, we, we get the same amount of people over the season as other sports, call it 700, 750,000 people um, a year. Um, you have millions and millions of fans across the world that vast majority of them will never s step their foot into the Levi Stadium, most likely. So how do you deliver that experience globally at this point um, is, is absolutely, absolutely important. Um, and, and really, social media is a tool to do that. Tracy? I, I think social media has really redefined what, what content was. I mean, back in, in the days when I was growing up, it was you know show up in front of your television, and that's it. And now it's really extended uh, the availability of content. And so when athletes start to, you know, tweet on the bus on the way to the stadium or have some sort of interesting uh, exchange in the locker room before things go into the silent period, I think there's there's just a, an incredible amount of access that these social platforms prompt. And uh, the really smart athletes uh, understand that they're, they're much more in control of their own brand. They don't, might not even be a starter or uh, an MVP, but they might have a tremendous influence on an audience that brings in lots more endorsement dollars, that helps them when they get traded to a different market. So, uh, you know, fandom is borderless. And so if uh, somebody follows somebody on a social platform, uh, and they go on an international tour, they play in the Olympic Games, or they play uh, over in, in Europe in a, a sport that isn't uh, 
necessarily indigenous to this country. So I, I really think it's, it's harnessed, um, uh, social media has harnessed a lot of the p available content, it's extended the time frame where sport and, and uh, the games are played and available, but it's also really um, given some tools and some unique opportunities to the brands and the athletes that take full advantage of them. Can I give a, a yeah, yeah. quick example? Um, one of our former players is actually a student now in George's class, Zaza Pachulia. Um, if you remember a few years ago, he was one of the top vote getters uh, for the All-Star Game because pretty much the entire country of Georgia, where he's from, <laughs> voted for him on social media. <laughs> And it's pretty incredible that this guy from this tiny country in Europe uh, received almost as many votes as someone like a Stephen Curry or a LeBron James. And now you're teaching him. Well, uh, he's <laughs> teaching me too <laughs> on that. Um, actually, the social media is interesting in the sense that the traditional broadcasters have relationships where they like to show live programs. But Facebook and YouTube are struggling in the sense that live into that audience is not the same as retrieval. And so what the leagues have to understand is that a lot of the, the social media is on a retrieval world, which is more valuable than a live world, which changes the, the contracts that these sporting organizations have got to worry about. Here's actually, it's, it's sort of a second question that came, it's a different card, but um, what technologies and trends in the sporting world do you see impacting other areas? Hmm, that's a good question. Do you want, oh, Bruno, you go first, and yeah. Tracy? Put Bruno on the That's spot. A, it, this is in other parts of your portfolio, I would imagine. Bruno? Yeah, um, look, I, I think one of the theses that we, when we establish our investment um, vehicle and fund is um, looking at really um, taking advantage of, of one trend that has really played out over the last few years, um, which is the, this disproportionate influence of sports on average consumer. Um, so I go back to my earlier point around the opportunities that we like to invest and commit capital to are these situations where, you know, there's clear application to sports, but there's a much bigger um, kind of mass consumer opportunity. Yeah. And that, um, you know, that, that cuts really across um, the music and, um, you know, commerce, um, you know, I, I take a look at, for example, somebody like, like a company like Beats or some of the others where they've really started in day and really taken advantage and, and done a really nice job with kind of influencing the mass consumer through power of sports and power of athletes. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that would be one, one example that I can clearly see. So the kind of overall entertainment being driven initially from some of the kind of elements of sports first and moving into the broader broader consumer. The other one is apparel um, and, and um, whether it's sneakers, kind of these new materials is a big trend in, in renewables and recycled materials yep. used for, for apparel that I think is really, really interesting um, for a host, whole host of reasons, um, not the least uh, the, the whole climate change that's, that we all are very well aware of. So. Um, that's going to be driven by sports and athletes first, and going to going to you know proliferate um, into the broader mass consumer. I, I have no doubt. Yeah, I, mean, I run a program for Nike, and, and Nike views the everybody's an athlete, yeah. and and getting an athlete endorsement is really the uh, platform at which they want to go to a much larger market. Tracy, right. in terms of. I think I'd, I'd take a step back just to reflect on something we take for granted is Wi-Fi. And it turns out it's really hard to get Wi-Fi in a very dense, densely populated, you know, round concrete bowl um, with 70,000 people, uh, which I learned from the engineers that I've worked with. That it's like having bags, 200 pound bags of water and multiplied by 70,000. So I hadn't really considered that analogy, but it turns out it's a, it's a pretty complicated physics uh, challenge in order to get Wi-Fi always on for everybody that's uploading their live videos or on their, their TikToks or whatever it might be during a live event in such a congested space. So sport has really stress tested something like Wi-Fi that we know it's ubiquitous, we expect it to be always on everywhere we go, but it's uh, provided some new um, challenges uh, to solve it in a high density environment. And don't even get me started on like a NASCAR environment with 200 mile an hour um, 
vehicles going in circles or <laughs> just extraordinarily difficult. But so I think sport really, um, the must-see TV component of live action, we expect it to be an ultra high definition that really um, puts a lot of challenge on the network infrastructure of a sports venue. And so having that expectation in your living room and then going to a sports event, whether it's on the big screen or maybe the three or four screens in your luxury suite, uh, you, you, you would not tolerate latency. You, you expect that it's going to be high definition. You expect that it's going to be um, as good as your home environment. So um, there's some unique challenges in sport that really make technology better. And those are, those are two that I think of from a venue standpoint. Daniel, Daniel. I'll give a, a non-technology answer, which is um, the emotional connection that sports has been able to, to create between people. Um, you know, I, I remember uh, it happens every single game, but there's, when you think about it, there's 18,000 strangers that, you know, come to every single Warriors game. And, and when Steph makes a huge three or, you know, Draymond has a huge dunk and you're high-fiving and, and these are people that you've never met in your life. But that emotional connection that brings you together or when, you know, we won uh, those three championships and over a million people showed up to each of those parades, you know, that's something that I think brands are starting to realize outside of sports is creating that emotional connection. You know, I grew up a Warriors fan. I grew up a Giants fan. Those are things that, that will stay with me for the rest of my life. And, and I have now a connection to those teams and those players that money can't buy. Yeah. And so how do you create that emotional connection with another brand that's not necessarily something you grew up with, but you feel like you can really align yourself with? It matches my beliefs and my values and what I stand for. Um, and I think sports has done an incredible job job um, of really building that emotional connection between uh, people, between players, between a sport. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Just to sort of do a bookend of the introduction of Daniel uh, on this, uh, we're seeing all these devices collecting information on people's health and fitness, which raises immense problems on privacy. And uh, I mean, the insurance companies would love to know what your daily heart monitor rate is in terms of setting premiums irrespective of your age. Those type of things, it, it, it translates in the sporting industry when players get traded, who has the rights to the data that the team has collected in the last five years, because that's very important in terms of whether it's a three year or five year contract. But in broader social issues, uh, I think we really haven't addressed very well the notion of privacy and information gathering and sports is just the tip of the iceberg there. Um, in the interest of time, uh, we have uh, a close here, and each of the participants, not me, thank goodness, <laughs> has to put up a word, and they have to give a story with it. So uh, we'll just go this way. Great. Well, where's mine? Over here. All right. So I put uh, perseverance. Um, I think for me, I, uh, I've been pretty lucky that I've been born and raised here and I grew up around technology, but um, the one thing I didn't realize is that jobs like these in sports in this industry even existed. And so um, you, I went into it as a 21-year-old with my eyes wide open and really just tried to learn as much as possible. And you end up hearing yes sometimes, we end up hearing no a lot of times as you learn this industry where often people have worked in for decades. And so um, the one thing that I, keep telling myself, and this could be in this job or any job, is just to keep pushing forward and persevere. And, and if you really believe in something, then um, you can make it happen. Tracy. My word is ask. And uh, this stems from living and working and learning and playing here in Silicon Valley for close to 30 years and being completely inspired by this place. It's, it's a magical place. And I know my career would not be what it has been, and I wouldn't be who I have become if I wasn't uh, able to ask really, really smart people. And there's a lot of vulnerability in asking questions. And I think that especially in an area like Silicon Valley or even in tech or even in sport, you know, there, there's a lot of strong personalities. There's a lot of competitive people. And uh, I, I think it's important to always be human in uh, understanding what we know, what we don't know. And I also think it's really important to ask somebody to be a mentor, ask for help. And these are skills that might not be um, underscored in, in more traditional education environments. But uh, I know how much uh, I've learned from my mentors. And uh, sometimes it just takes one ask for help. And, and you have a, a teacher for life. Right now. Um, my, word, my word is relationships, um, and it has a couple of different meanings. Um, the, the one, the, the world of sports is, is large, but um, 
the the world of business of sports is incredibly small. Um, everybody knows everybody. Building lasting relationships is important. Um, every week, I'm reminded just how small the world is. There's there's multiple connections to those same people. Um, and look, you do deals and you work with people that you like, right? Um, so. Being able to build those relationship, maintain them, and really uh, nurture them is, is is incredibly powerful. Okay, so just in uh, just to really like thank the audience for coming here, and I'm, I know we're going to have some thanks from uh, the Kumi History Museum, but uh, we really enjoyed working with Daniel and Marguerite and David and Karina, and it's just been a true joy. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.